I'm just very grateful to have Ms. V. Elizabeth Perkins um, with us today from the John Mayvera Perkins Foundation along with uh, Pastor Chris Collins. And I just want to share a brief bio. Uh, Ms. V. Elizabeth Perkins served as the co-president as well as the missions coordinator. Uh, a few quotes from her. Um, Looking back over my life, I see how God has brought me to this time and place. This represents not only where we are in our own lives, but where we want to take others as well. Whether she has guided you through the intricacies of establishing and managing your own foundation or helping you establish a youth ministry or mentoring program, Elizabeth brings passion and purpose to your mission. She has spent time in Africa ministering and serving the navigators. Her goal is simple yet profound, helping next generations encounter and follow Jesus to bless a broken world. So just very grateful to have you and look forward to learning from you today. I also want to mention that everyone should have on their seat a Justice Perkins Justice Pilgrimage Program. And this is very exciting because the college has already committed to hosting two trips um, to Mississippi. And I'm so grateful that we'll have the opportunity to learn from the, Pat the Perkins family as well as Pastor Cannon, really literally sitting at their feet. And if I think about it, um, how, how old are your parents? Are they in their eighth? Okay, so John Perkins is 89 and Vera Mae Perkins is 86. And so I just think about how, even before we get to Mississippi, how inspiring that is, that they would dedicate the years of their life, just throughout their life and all the challenges that they went through, that they would invite people into their home, into their community, so we could just learn and be able to continue the work of of Jesus and, and the work of justice. So we are going to, in the back, we'll have two sign-up sheets. Our goal is we'll do one trip during spring break, and we'll have 15 to 20 people go on the spring break trip, and then we will host another trip in the month of June during the summer months. So a total of 40 people we are looking for to go to the Justice uh, Perkins pilgrimage. Not only does it include getting the opportunity to learn directly, from John and Vera Mae Perkins, but we will also have the opportunity to basically do historical tours in Mississippi, which I think will also really strengthen and make our experience more robust. So I would just encourage you to sign up um, to present, I mean, to attend and participate in those amazing events. I think they'll be life-changing as well as transformative. And now I would like to also introduce um, Chris Cannon, Pastor Chris Cannon, who is a part of the consulting team. He serves as the lead in the West office. I'm grateful that you're here from California. I hope you like the snow. <laughs> um, he's actually been a part of the uh, Perkins team um, since 1991, and he's actually been personally mentored by John Perkins. He's a church planter and a pastor for over 25 years, and he has been to uh, Jackson, Mississippi countless times. His passion, Pastor Cannon's passion, is to connect churches to the justice pilgrimage so that the mission and the vision can spread to the West Coast. If you would like to also talk to your church members about getting involved, uh, Pastor Cannon is the person to see as well. So without further delay, super grateful that you guys made it here safely and so grateful to God to have you. So if we can go ahead and get started. Thank you. So no one told me about the snow. I, I don't you know, I had to, get long, had to buy long pants today for this occasion, so. <laughs> Um, thank you for inviting us to the very first Rodney Cisco Symposium. We are honored to be here. Last night was amazing. Who was here last night? Were you here last night? Wow, it's an amazing time. So we want to show a, a little one-minute commercial that's from Procter & Gamble, of all people. It doesn't have anything to do with product, but it's a conversation. It's called The Look. So we're going to interact for a few minutes after we show this uh, little commercial. So let's take a look at the screen.
let's talk about the look. What, uh, let's interact with that for a few minutes. What uh, did you take out of that? What, what was an observation? What did you feel? What did you sense? Just want to raise your hand and we'll interact for a few moments. Dirt and can leave the wax even Procter and Gamble. <laughs> Anybody at all before I call on you? Yes. Tension. tension. Yeah, and what, and what kind of tension would you say? Yeah. Yeah, uncertainty. Okay, anybody else? Assumptions, okay. Yeah, tell me more about that. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, assumptions. Yes. I sense a controlled anger. Uh huh. Right. Controlled anger, you've gotten the look. Yeah. How many people have gotten the look before in this room? Raise your hand. Okay. How many people have not gotten the look in this room? Raise your hand. Okay. So this is, this is why we want to talk about the look, right? Because maybe you have, maybe you, maybe you haven't, right? But if you haven't gotten the look, there's, 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 is the camera turns at the end, right? There's, the assumptions are being brought out, aren't they? What we're going to be seeing. Any other comments? Yeah, Sheila. Yeah. Yeah. Every day in dignities. Every day, every day, going to the gym, going to a restaurant, taking your son to a swim class or in the pool and in the car and every regular opportunities, regular everyday living and meeting those and being faced with indignity and just going through your everyday life, right? Yes. Fear masked by power. Yeah. Yeah. What else? Yes, sir. Some people would assume uh, that now that he's a judge, he's going to start to use things. Right, right. In a different way. Yeah. Just like you said, the everyday, it, it just becomes part of what you, you understand. Right. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. I think that the smile at the end disarms a little bit, but you aren't sure quite, is he going to use this, is this going to be turned around? But there's something almost in the, maybe it's again an assumption that he understands that here he is now, the one that has authority. And he's it obviously is a judge in an honorable role as opposed to whatever people might be thinking of him in other settings. Yes. Yeah. Again, right. And see, I have no idea what that means. I don't have any idea what that means to wake up and to think again. And that's why we want this conversation to happen. Thank you for making this happen. Thank you. Other, other thoughts before we transition? Okay. Really? I don't know. I mean, Liz told me about it, and I saw it, but I've never seen it before on TV. But I, it has. It seems like it might be a Super Bowl era type of commercial, but it, because it has nothing to do with the product. But I'm certainly grateful, and if anybody has time to send P and G, uh, thank you for that because it was nothing about their product, but it certainly was about humanity and life in our world. Well, I want to say something about, just real briefly before I transition to Miss Liz, that in 1991, I was, I just turned 30, and my uh, young life leader who introduced me to Jesus Christ introduced me to Dr. John Perkins, and he said, you've got to meet this man. He has a, he has a vision like yours, 
in Houston, Pasadena, I'm a South Bay surfer from Los Angeles, and I said, well, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna go meet Dr. Perkins. So I, I went out to Pasadena, I get out of my car, this is before there was Google. Some of you may not even imagine life before Google, right? But so I got out of my car, I have no idea who Dr. Perkins is. I walk up the stairs to this uh, old home in Pasadena. There's an older Africa, African-American man sweeping the porch with, uh, with his broom. He's got holes in his knees, pant legs, and I, he says, what are you doing? I said, I'm looking for Dr. Perkins. He said, well, you're looking at him. And he took a bucket, and turned it upside down, and started to, to, to teach me about reconciliation. I was not expecting to see an older African-American man named Dr. Perkins. I brought my whiteness into that conversation from the get-go. And for almost 30 years now, I've been discipled and mentored and taught and corrected about a lot of things. So I'm very, very honored to be at Wheaton for this occasion and this symposium. And um, it's my honor to, to bring up um, Elizabeth Perkins. So Liz. Good morning. <laughs> I had a long day yesterday, so I'm trying to uh, make sure I'm, I'm in the right place at the right time. Uh, I want to thank Sheila and Wheaton for wanting to have this conversation on diversity. Um, one of the things that I felt, okay, when I, first of all, I'm going to be real relaxed, okay? Uh, when I saw this video, I immediately sent it to Chris. Chris and I have been having conversations about race and, and how it feels to be a black woman in, in this society. And I was like, okay, you gotta see this, you gotta see this. I knew exactly how that man was feeling. I have felt it so many times before. And I, I I experienced it, and I was feeling, when I saw it, I was like, uh, not again. Why are so many people ignorant? Sometimes it makes me so mad. Then I remember, if you don't have relationships with other cultures, all you know is the stereotype. When, what I noticed, was that these stereotypes are taught. The children in the video acknowledged one another. The little girl was waving, but as soon as the mother saw that she rolled up the window, her mother had taught her to be friendly um, to people, but only to people who look like her. Now, diversity, this is a college, let's define diversity. Diversity is the state of being diverse, Webster says, a range of different things. I believe that diversity and reconciliation has a lot to do with your experience and what you are going to experience. My experience, I'm gonna give y'all a little background on my experience. My parents and um, family have been working for reconciliation and justice. Actually, this is the 60th year. Um, we used to be, we used to say 50, 50 something years. Now I actually get to say for, for 60 years. So that's exciting. And I remember I was my daddy's baby. I was the eighth child of eight. And I remember when my dad was beaten in the Brandon jail I remember after he, when he got back, he was this man who was all bruised and battered. And before, before then, he was marching with my mama, and they was marching in the marches. And my um, father was just like this strong man. You know, he, was a, he had been a fighter in the regiment. And so I'm thinking, he, this is my hero. Once, after he had gotten beaten in that jail, our whole family's life changed. Not just my dad, but everybody in my family. And for me, as a little girl, I was thinking, huh, how can this, how can I reconcile this in my mind? 
we had, had white people coming down and serving in the ministry all this time. But here is, here are these white men who have beaten up my dad. Now, how am I supposed to like these people and they're white and here are these men? So this is what I said. You know, I'm not gonna like Southern white people. And I made it, and mind you, I'm four years old trying to reconcile this in my head. I wanna like these people who are coming to be with us and, and march with us and serve with us. But on the other hand, we have these Southern, Southerners. And so I said, I just, it's, it's Southern white people. And so from then on, well, Fast forward, my parents had, this, had started traveling a lot. And when I was 14, I'm fast forwarding to 14 because I want to tell you something that, that's going to relate, that's relating to this. When I was 14, they said, uh, would you like to go to a private boarding school? And you know, I'm like, I'm sure. In my mind, I'm thinking, I'm getting away from them. I'm going to be here with friends all the time. And so I did. But I got there, and it was an all-white boarding school. But it was an all-white southern boarding school. So now I'm thinking, well, I can handle this. My family has been fighting for justice all these years. I, you know, I, I know how to, how to deal with, with these southerners. I got there, and what I expected was their, them to not like me. But they loved, they loved me, and I loved them, and I developed some, uh, um, I have long lifetime friendships. So now, how can I not like Southern white folks anymore? How am I reconciling this in my spirit? I had to begin to, it was time for me to just forgive those Southern white men who had hurt our family because all people were not like that. Just like that little, um, that little girl in the car. You know, I felt like at school, we were, without our parents, we were different. We were able to, um, learn from each other and, and be around each other and learn about one another's culture. But when you put the, the adults, adults, we're the problem. We bring all our baggage in. And for me, I still bring baggage in. But it's important that I recognize my baggage and try to try to move forward. I, I forget that he over there. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just uh, um, I believe that. Well, I John Piper says. Diversity is a thermometer, so to speak, not the thermostat. Which one are you? You want to talk a little bit about that? You, don't, you sure not, Chris? Come on. I remember being at that school, at that boarding school, and one of the things that I wanted to be and I hoped to be was the thermostat. And I believe that, you know, at, at that school, a lot of things changed. There were instances where I, I was called the N-word, but I didn't want, I didn't go fight. For, you, know, you know, like physical, that, no, I had to be smart. And so I, went and fought with the system. Um, y'all, let me just tell y'all this story. I remember a boy calling me the N-word at my boarding school. And I was just thinking, 
what am I going to do? Am I going to let this go? Or am I going to go to the higher ups and, and start and, t and talk to them? Because if, if I let it go, it was going to continue to happen. So I went up to the, I went to the psychologist. I think I get this, dr drum, this dramatic personality from my mom and my dad, because they both got, have a little drum. <laughs> I went up there to the psychologist. Oh, I don't know how I'm going to live at this school. Uh, he said, what's going on? I said, someone just called me the N-word. Now, also, you can't let, let kids know too much. I think I just need to leave and take my government money with me. <laughs> now, that's the key. That's knowing too much, right? <laughs> and so uh, they got on it, and what we used to have levels. And, and what happened is they put him in solitary confinement. I needed to make that statement. I had four, I had four years to be at that school. This was happening in the four, first year. That had to happen so they can see, okay, she's not going to put up with this. Um, and, you know, let's get to know her. So that was, that's why I feel like I hope that I kind of became the thermostat instead of the, the thermometer. Um, I know that... Uh, I've been, I'm up here talking a lot. Chris, I want you to okay. chime in some here. Because I got, I got plenty of stories to tell, but I, I, want, I want you to come up here and uh, say a little bit. Okay. Well, let, let me, you know, I, how do we become thermometers and how do we become thermostats, right? How do we go from reflecting the culture to impacting the culture? And, and I guess I'm thinking about some of the questions that Dr. Perkins has helped me frame in my time with him. And part of this comes from the, the book of Nehemiah. And we think about what it means to rebuild the walls. And, we, and, and in, those time, in that time, those walls had been broken down for over 100 years. So when Nehemiah shows up on the scene as someone not born in Jerusalem, but he has a heart for his people, and he finds out the conditions of the walls are broken down, and he mourns, and he fasts, and weeps, and prays. And then, he, and then he prays a prayer that seems profound, doesn't it? The prayer includes a prayer of confession. I confess the sins we have committed, me and my father's household. And so the question that was raised last night that I, that I got from Dr. Perkins was, will I take responsibility for something I didn't cause? Will I take responsibility for something I didn't cause? And, and Dr. King drove it home hard last night, didn't she? She said, you know, I, I wasn't alive back then. I, I, it wasn't me. It wasn't I, I, I'm, I'm innocent. But here's Nehemiah, who wasn't even alive, and says, we did this. I did this. And being around Liz, we've talked about this a lot. And children, we have these conversations about, you know, Chris, you're a, you're, you are a white man, and you have power. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know what kind of power you're talking about, but you have assumption, you, you have resources, you have wealth, and I'm thinking, you, you know, do you really know what I have and don't have? But, but right away, and, I'm, and I have an opportunity to say, I can repent of that, or I can say, I'm nothing to do with this. I can either be a thermostat, right, and set the temperature and change the climate by my own involvement in my own interest and my own ownership, or I can say, hey, you're talking to the wrong guy. I'm not a Southerner. I'm just a white man from California. Or I can say, hey, Liz, on behalf of white people and white men, I repent of the way that you've been treated, and not only you, but others have been treated. Taking ownership of this, whether we did it or didn't do it, is part of the healing, isn't it? And part of the, the responsibility that we can take for sins that I did not commit. But isn't that the gospel? I mean, didn't Jesus take a cross that wasn't his cross to bear? Didn't he take the sins he didn't commit? Right? So this isn't an, an unusual concept to say, I'm going to bear the burdens for things I did not do. We have it in the form of a cross. And we were charged last night hard by Dr. King to take up a cross daily and that cross might mean the sins that have been committed by people like us 
And in our omission, say, look, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan drives home a point that the two men that should have done something didn't do anything. Mm. Right? They did not do anything. That sin of omission is on a lot of us, not only white people, but on all of us in various forms. So the question, a key question that I got from Dr. Perkins, and I think the thermostat thermometer analogy reminds me that will I take responsibility for something I didn't do? My daughter, she's at, uh, uh, she works for World Vision in Washington, D.C. And I said, Tessa, what do you think I should talk about you know, in this time? And she said, Dad, take responsibility for the church's hypocrisy for the last 100 years. Wow. I said, I, I didn't ask you to talk for me, Tessa. <laughs> And she said, Dad, you know, you know. And I said, no, I've been, when I've been to Israel and Yad Vashem, when I've been to the Holocaust Museum, when I've been to, to the Jackson Museum, everybody, whether it's the Holocaust or it's racism, the church was not doing anything in the midst of that. The Jewish people hold the church liable for the inactivity during the, during the Holocaust. In the same way, fairly, I think, the black community can hold the white community, the white church, responsible for saying, we're not, we're not part of this. Taking responsibility for the sins of others, including our own families and our own generations, is healthy and right. And Jesus did that. The cross is the picture of taking responsibility for someone else's sins. Amen? Amen. We live in a broken world. I like to call diversity being in the living room. Now, I want to take us to the kitchen table. Let's talk a little bit about reconciliation. Our relationships with God and with each other are broken, but God has had a plan from the beginning for a perfect, unified, and beautiful, diverse family. While we wait for his fulfillment of this promise, we labor together to see his kingdom come. Now, we all have heard and know that in order to be reconciled, we have to be God to reconcile from God, us people to God. Although, like Chris just finished, we could never deserve it, we have been given peace with God through the life, and, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This gift changes everything because we have been shown abundant love and received this new life. We desire for every person made in his image to also have the chance to hear and respond to the good news. We seek out every opportunity to speak the truth of Jesus with joy. Then we take every opportunity to adorn our words with actions to display the gospel in a tangible way. We often fall short, but we rest in his grace and extend the grace to others. Jesus is the reason we are here, and he is the hope for the broken people people to people. Now we have our, we know this relationship with God and a lot of us have our own personal relationship with God. But what about from people to people? What kind of relationships do we have with other people and how do we view them? Our cities, have had a history of racial divide. I was talking to Stephanie. I said, ooh, it's nice to live in Chicago. I would love to live in Chicago, as long as I ain't live in the city. See what I'm saying? And this has left deep wounds, broken relationships, and marginalized communities. communities. We remain a, a largely divided city and we believe in crossing bridges to learn and grow together in order to see change. Following the teachings of Jesus, we surrender our rights to serve others above ourselves. We create a safe space 
for people to grieve, repent, forgive, rejoice, and heal together. When this happens, relationships can be restored, both within the community and with those who would otherwise never cross paths with someone in the community. We have to make effort. We have to make an effort. If we want to see um, reconciliation happen and not just, you know, be in a room with each other, lifting our hands, well, it's a bunch of different people, colors in here tonight. If we want to be in a room with our hands lifted and singing a song and listening to the preacher preach, and then afterwards we go our own way. I don't believe that that will have any effect in this world. But if we want to go deeper and begin to <clears throat> build relationships after we sing, go meet somebody, decide I'm going to have coffee with them, we have to start getting together if we want to see any change made. Now, the pro this, part of the problem is we, it's comfortable to be with who, and you know, who I'm, who I'm, people like me. And it's uncomfortable to be with people and cultures that aren't like me. We have to get uncomfortable. We have to begin if we want to see any kind of change, it's all right to be uncomfortable. Because you got, you know, after you're uncomfortable for this little while, you're going to go back to your comfort place. But you have stepped out of your comfort zone. And that's, a, that's an important first step in going to the kitchen table. Mm -hmm. So let me jump off that for a second. So when when you, what do you think of when you think of the kitchen table? What do you th what what comes to mind for you? Just a couple of maybe you share. What's uh, what's in family. family conversations? Did anybody? I grew up. In, my dad. We didn't talk at our table. My dad didn't want to hear a single word from our, from us as kids. We didn't want to be quiet. But last night we had the we had the table. We had the dinner. We dinner at the Harbor House. We had a great conversation. But usually it means relationship, right? Dialogue, mm -hmm. and what. We want, and in, in what we need are new eyes. It's sympathy versus empathy. Is, that a, is there a difference between those two concepts, right? One is I feel bad for you. One is I can connect with you. I can feel what I think you're feeling. That's what, that's what hurts, right? It's uncomfortable to have empathy. Sympathy is like that. It must be, that, that's bad to be you, right? Versus I can imagine what you're going through. That's why the look's so powerful, right? Because we, we put ourselves, we're, we're actually given the opportunity to see out of different eyes, don't we? And so in Nehemiah's story, Nehemiah takes some of these faithful men of his, and he takes them around the walls, and he says, do you see the trouble that we're in? Well, they'd probably seen it for years, but they just hadn't seen it with those eyes. Suddenly they say, let's begin this good work, but that for, for almost 100 years those walls have been down, but somehow in some way somebody said, let's look at it with different eyes, a different perspective, and they get it. You know, but Paul, when Paul was Saul, how did God get his attention? He blinded him. He took away his perception. Then he says, and he, he prays in Ephesians 1, God, open the eyes of my heart for understanding. And then he says in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, he says, you know, we no longer regard each other the way we used to. Though we once regarded Christ, we do so no more. Here's a guy saying, I used to be a persecutor of the church. Now he says, I see G Jew and Greek and slave and free and male and female differently because of Christ. We have new eyes. On the pilgrimage that we'll take you on, and we can't wait to, to do this with Wheaton, we'll ask the question of you, and I asked this question on our youth trip recently. If I were white, dot, dot, dot. If I were black, dot, 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 answer the question. So we had some great sharing. I was the only white man on the team at this time. 
And so the sharing was, if I were white, I could own a home. If I were white, I could go to college. If I were white, the police wouldn't profile me, right? If I were white, one person said, I wouldn't have a heritage I'm proud of. And I said, like you just might have reacted, I said, whoa, can you elaborate? And she said, I wouldn't have had anything to overcome if I were white. And I thought, and then she asked me, what have you had to overcome, Pastor Chris, as a white man? I said, I can't think of anything that I've had to overcome because I'm a white man. See, that's new eyes. That's the, that's the value of the table. You know, one thing our church has done for years that I'm most excited about, or very excited about, is we would have potlucks. Those are dangerous. I know, I understand that. But, but this was a twist. It was bring your grandmother's favorite dish or your mom's favorite dish that you liked. So it was, it was bring something from your family. Bring something from your heritage and bring it. And then it became a conversation piece. Oh, I didn't know you were Lebanese. Oh, I didn't know you were from the South. Oh, I didn't know you were from. And that opened doors to, oh, tell me about your family and your heritage and your history. And those are the ways that we can help create the conversations around diversity. So the kitchen table, the dining room table, the restaurant table, whatever it might be, but please, I mean, here. Hear, hear Miss Liz and say that's a place where we can really stretch and move into a place where we can not only talk about diversity, but again, be the break down the walls that separate us from having true reconciliation. There are something toward at the end here that I want to share with you all. Give me a second here, y'all. So I had it in two places. But it's about being at the kitchen table and really experiencing one another's culture. One thing that I'm excited about here at Wheaton is um, the Shalom House. That's a great opportunity uh, for people to really get to know one another and become real friends. You know, we talk about getting to know one another. I want a friend. I want a real friend. And that's what we have to start striving for in relationships. Now, it's gonna hurt and sometimes like me, Chris and I have had instances where he has said some things or I have said some things where we both want to just walk away. But it's hard for me because the tapes that are in my head, we have to erase those tapes and begin to um, create our own messages. You know, I got the little tapes in my head about the share, the, the share, the beatings, you know, the beating. I got the uh, tapes in my head about the, uh, my school. And a lot of tapes that you have in your head that you have, to, you have to erase and write new and try, and try. It's all about trying. Because this right here, I almost gave up on him. <laughs> we had an a incident where I was like, he's just another white man, you know, and he didn't even know what he had done. But by us being friends, I had to, it was important. If I'm going to really be his friend, like I'm saying, we, I want to be a friend, I had to talk to him. No, I, I didn't, it, it took us months to, to reconcile. And 
and it turned out that I, I took the side of another white man over our friendship. And I went with the power, and she showed it to me. That I, I in a conflict, I made a decision to align with my color without even really understanding what was going on. And it wasn't until I heard her pain or heard her tears on the phone that I realized how hard this is and how deep this is and, and how important it was for me to have this relationship over the comforts of something that was much easier and that offered me some tangible reward for aligning with color and power and gender. And, uh, and I'm thankful that we worked through it because it's what this is about, is, is, the, is understanding each other. It's a lot more than, than gender and race. It was, a, it was deep and it was painful, but I'm glad we've, we've worked through it. We, we are... <laughs> We are not up here just saying do this. We are doing it. And we're going to continue to because I can't get up here and talk if I'm not doing it. No, I'm not walking the talk. And so this right here, I, oh, let me tell y'all this. <laughs> I've always, you know, people have always said the, the relationships, you know, you needs to be, you know, the, in, the interracial relationship needs to be, uh, the yoke fellas, so should I say, need to be a man and a, a white man and a white and a black man. And I have believed, I believe that. This happened. This just happened. And I am so glad to have Chris in my life and my bro and as my brother. And um, you know, he he reminds me of of my oldest brother Spencer. And I think that's kind of why I um, leaned a little bit toward him because you know he has that personality that's a lot like him. So. Are we doing, we're doing questions right now? Is sure. that what you said, right? We can, we can, oh, we can, we can do questions. Says, I'm, yes. I'm, you tell us when. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah I Perfect. think so. Good morning. Good morning. College. Uh, oh, well. You know, when I was 13 years old, this is the last thing I expected I'd ever be doing, is speaking in public like this. But I just want to say, this seems like a gold mine over here at Wheaton College. I didn't know you guys were over here. And all this beautiful facility. And so I just want to say greetings, and I hope I can find a way to be of assistance in some way at Wheaton College. But I just want to direct a comment to you guys that whatever you're talking about seems to be pretty heavy. And I just wonder if you can share any details with us so we know what in the world you're talking about because it sounds very important. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Well, I think we got a lot of that done before you got here, Stephanie, oh, but I'm sorry. it's okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to first things first, Stephanie. Well done. Yeah, go see your pastor first. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. It's not really a question. There you go. Get right behind you. Oh, okay. Um, it, it's to um, encourage you in your relationship together. Um, I have been married to a white guy, a white dude for 26 years. Oh, Lordy. Has it been a journey for us? And um, I didn't become more white, and he certainly did not come more black. <laughs> and um, we have differences in political um, issues and things like that. And sometimes I get really angry, and I'll say to him, especially living in this community, I can't go around marrying every white man for him to understand the situation. <laughs> and, um, you know, I only get one in a lifetime. And so, um, but one of the things I've noticed with my relationship with my husband is that I don't have the choice to give up. 
like so many of you guys in this room, are to avoid the conflict that comes with this. Because God has yoked me with a man that's different from me, he's racially different from me, and I don't have that choice. Some days, even being married to him, I am absolutely angry and frustrated that he cannot see the stuff that my family and my sons go through in this community. And so many times I'll cry and we'll come together, we'll talk about it, and I'm just watching his heart come, coming into it. He wasn't designed to be a black man and I wasn't designed to be a white woman. And so those perspectives come together, make us so much more stronger and I'm, I know that I always say, if God had made me earlier marry a black man, I'd be leading a Black Panther revolt right now. <laughs> and so I don't have that choice. And do my love to him. We stay strong, and we continue to work with this battle together. And it is not an option for us to give up. And so I just wanted to share that with you guys. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Other comments or questions? Okay, all right. You've seen reticent. Yeah, the long, I, I'm going to have to tell you, we've already talked about it. As I was walking in, I heard reference to you don't, what, what was it? You, you don't have struggles or you don't know what struggles are. And I would just throw out there that racial issues are not the only struggle that people have. Everybody has some kind of struggles, whether it's health, whether it's family discord, whether it's loss of job, whether it's I can't get into college, whether it is I can't, I don't know how to finish high school. And so anytime I hear reference to because you're a certain color, you don't have to deal with anything or you don't know what struggle is about. I take issue and I get kind of emotional about it. So I think we should talk about that too. Thank you. All right. Yes, sir. I think one of the things that you brought up early, and this video does very well, is the uh, concept of why we're having this discussion to begin with in terms of race and the skin you're in, right? in that uh, there's certain things you cannot step out of no matter what happens. You know, um, I walk down the street and certain people just make assumptions all already. You know, I'm not from America, I'm Jamaican by birth, right? So I see the world differently to begin with, but again, just like you saw in the commercial, certain assumptions are made that no matter what I do just for me stepping out of my car, based on the car that I pulled up in, what I'm wearing when I get out the car, before I open my mouth, there's certain assumptions that have been made that allow us to be able to work and, and move because we put people in boxes. We just do, all right? And um, that helps us to be able to function because we understand. And when that doesn't fit the box, then we get the head tilt, we get the look, we get all these different things. But as we talk about this specifically, there's, there's a, those are different, like what you're stating are different things that have happened that are points in time mm -hmm. where this is something that I will live in and you will live in until you die. But it's something that God wants us to be a part of because it continues throughout eternity, right? Where, you know, marriage, the reflection of Christ's love for the church and sacrifice for the church ends when eternity begins. But every tribe, tongue, and nation will be around that glassy sea. So there's something unique about how he's crafted each of us that we've got to figure out as she said, and I love that quote, we must learn to live together as brothers and sisters or we will perish as fools. And so this skin that we're in is one, I think, a reflection of God's creative design. And again, that we could be one, as Dr. Hill was saying the other day, is important for us to figure out how we're going to work this out. Because I'm going to always be a black man till the day I die. Right, yeah. And that is part of how God created me to interact with the world and engage with the world. And the different things that come along, you know, and that's why I think there's a, there's a unique shift between, um, you know, what you are afforded and what is a privilege. And that, I think, goes back to what has happened before and now you're living in a privileged society. 
and, and you know, Uncle Ben said it in Spider-Man, with great privilege comes great responsibility. But that's the reality of the situation, is that it isn't, you did nothing to get that privilege. We did nothing to get the privilege of being born to who we were, when we were, when we were, and to what kind of access we get. But now that we have that privilege, there's a responsibility that we must do something with it. Mm -hmm. So it might not be my fault that this is what happened, but because of my privilege, it's my responsibility to act on it. Amen. One of the things that um, I like to think about is, and I think you mentioned it, is really trying to walk a man in somebody else's shoes and trying to see the world um, through, as Rodney and I would like to say, through black eyes, through brown eyes, through green eyes, through red eyes. Because, you know, as it says, we, we want to know the Lord and to know him fully. And you can't really know him if you don't know him through all these different kinds of eyes. Mm -hmm. We all just know a piece of him. And so, as it's been written, the most segregated hour um, in the world is um, 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. We all retreat to our brown church, our black church, our white church. And um, it was 26 years ago when many of our friends said, you guys crazy, you matter what? But the Lord led us to an all-white church. And we labored there for 25 years because we felt very convicted that if we were serious about racial reconciliation, that we should live it. Mm -hmm. And so we went to an all-white church. And for the first year, it was difficult. I mean, people, people in the church would tell us, you guys are lost. The black churches are across the river. Or if I would say amen, they would tell me, we don't do that here. Or if I cried, they would say, did John Rodney have a fight? I mean, these were the things that we were subjected to the first year um, while we were in the church. Uh, but we remained. And uh, we understood why the Lord called us there eventually. But I say this to say, we spend a lot of time practicing and rehearsing to be good at our craft, good at our discipline. And yet we say we are Christians, we wanna be followers of Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing in our lives. We wanna be children of the kingdom, you know? We wanna smell like our rabbi and have his dust be on us. Like I tell my children, my boys, if you don't have the dust of your rabbi on you, nobody knows who you are. You need to follow closely behind him so the dust from his sandals are on you. And so you got to practice walking behind him regularly, you know? And so how are we practicing walking behind our rabbi? Are we worshiping like he would worship? You know? And so when he comes for his kingdom, a lot of us gonna be shocked when we get there because mm -hmm. we don't know how to worship together. So when he says, thy kingdom come on earth, mm -hmm. that means it is possible, people. It is definitely possible. Mm -hmm. It's not a dream, as I said last night. Rodney and I, we believed it's possible. So it's not something you retreat to your corner and talk about get up out of your bed on Sunday morning and find that uncomfortable place and make it happen. Mm -hmm. You know, make it happen. Because it's your brother and your sister. Learn to sing in Spanish. If you don't know the word, read it off the screen. And eventually it becomes something you understand. Because when you get to heaven, believe me, you're going to learn to sing that way. So I might as well practice it now. I traveled around the world for, where, for my job. And I make sure every time I was in a different city, I went to church in China. I went to church in Dubai. I and I'm telling you, worship in those places was sweeter than worshiping in the United States. So I'm telling you, we're going to be so surprised. Practice it now. Practice it now. It is beautiful to be one of the many colors of the rainbow. Amen. Amen.
I was thinking of uh, Mordecai's words to Esther for such a time as this, right? And that you and your husband would be at Wheaton at this time. And Wheaton is the gold standard for Christian colleges and universities to have this symposium and to make this call. Um, and I guess it's 1032, so and to borrow from last night and this morning, may we all, may we each be covered in the dust of our rabbi. Amen? Amen. All right, thank you. Have a, good, have a great day. We can do a little bit better than that. <laughs> yes, let's give it up. That was awesome. Because like you said, you're not just talking to talk, you're walking to walk. And we just appreciate you being an example of what it looks like to love well and to be followers of Christ. So thank you so much for that message. And you guys will join us, right, if you want to um, actually engage with them. And please don't forget to take your Perkins Justice Pilgrimage. And we have a sign up in the back if you're interested in the trip with Dr. Perkins and John Vera Mae Perkins and Elizabeth Perkins as well. So grateful for that. Uh, we're going to take maybe a 10-minute break, and we would, ask that we would invite you back to join us. We're going to have a really great lineup. So our next panel is the Biblical Vision for Kingdom Diversity. And we will have as the facilitator Pastor Dr. Daniel Hill, along with Dr. Kristen Ford, Dr. Esau McCauley, and Dr. Emily McGowan. So again, we encourage you to come back um, for that session. So 10-minute break. Thank you.